Okay, let's get started. Welcome to Women History Month's interview series hosted by Superposition Fremont and Foundation for Advocating Youth Education, Faye. My name is Ashita Singh. And I'm Ria Shah, and we're going to be your co-host for today's interview. Um, so today's, uh, today's interview is going to be split into two parts. Uh, we're first going to be talking about um, Ms. Ambika's journey to where she, um, you know, I mean, how she got here today and her uh, educational journey. And then we're going to be going into more, um, more of a women empowerment segment. Um, okay, so the first thing that we're going to do is, um, uh, Ms. Mbika, could you please introduce, uh, introduce yourself, um, tell us, you know, who you are, uh, what you currently do, and what, uh, what was your biggest motivation uh, to entering uh, the career that you're in right now? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, so, uh, like Ria mentioned, uh, my name is Ambika, and I'm currently a postdoctoral fellow and I work at Baylor College of Medicine um, in the lab of Dr. Huda Zogby. And she was actually someone who, a really great researcher who has done a lot of work um, in uh, some rare genetic disorders, uh, spinal cerebral ataxia type one, and also Rett syndrome. So I'm you know, really fortunate to have the opportunity to spend some time working in her lab and you know, contributing towards uh, some of the um, some of the uh, work in terms of understanding these complex disorders. All right. Um, okay. And so if you could tell us a little bit about like, what was your biggest motivation um, into, you know, getting into like medical research? Yeah. So initially um, I first, uh, the first set of research that I ever did was on cancer. And that was way back when I was um, doing my master's. And I was actually studying um, a type of oncogenic protein, RAS uh, P21. And I was using these like frog um, oocytes. So they're a type of South African um, frog that's called Xenopus. And we were using these uh, the oocytes from these frogs to study this like oncogenic protein. And it was just fascinating to see, you know, just how you can actually use these different model organisms to study um, diseases. And so I wanted to actually do a bit more in terms of like understanding um, disorders and how we could use research to help patients with, with these disorders. So then I went on to, um, to a lab where we were actually using mice. So actually we used mice and then we also use cultures that, um, so new, neuronal cultures that we, um, that we made from rats and also from mice. And then we could use these uh, two different sort of systems to understand um, the process of myelination. So all nerves in, in our brain, a majority of nerves are, um, are covered by this myelin sheet that allows the, um, the, the nerve impulses to rapidly travel from one neuron to the next. And um, that was like a really great system to be able to understand uh, this process of, of myelination. And from there, then I actually went on to do my PhD work and um, going more into specific disorders. And this time I was focusing on a particular region of the brain, which is the cerebellum. Um, and the cerebellum is important for movement disorders. So when you think about anything that's involved in coordinating movement and maintaining balance, your cerebellum is involved in that. And um, I got a chance to work on some really rare disorders that affect um, a number of different patients, uh, one of which is called ataxia to injectasia. And I know it's a, it's a long complicated <laughs> word, but it's shortened to AT. Um, and it's funny because it actually, that's, it's, it's my initials as well. So <laughs> it just happened <laughs> to be that I started working on a disorder with the same, uh, um, that had the same initials as my name. Um, but this disorder affects um, very young kids, and unfortunately, when they have this, uh, this disorder, they become wheelchair bound by eight to 10 years of age, and then they end up dying um, by the time they reach their early 20s. So it's a very devastating disorder. Um, and in, in my graduate research, I was trying to understand what was causing 
these, um, you know, why a mutation in this particular protein that causes this disorder, why it was causing such um, really severe symptoms in these patients. And was there anything that we could do eventually to be able to help these patients with this disorder? So that's kind of like why I really got into research and what drew me to, um, to neurodegeneration in, in general, because I really wanted to find a way to actually help patients. Yeah, yeah no, that, that's really, really interesting. Thank you so much for sharing that. Okay, so um, our next question is, um, what are the biggest setbacks that you have faced on your journey to I mean, like uh, entering your career of choice, um, perhaps any issues that you faced? And what are the biggest setbacks that you have faced on your journey to I mean, like uh, entering your career of choice, um, perhaps any issues that you faced in the workplace itself? Yeah, um, I would say, you know, one, one of the issues, the biggest issues that I've had um, throughout my entire journey was um, my background. And why do I say that? So I came from a home where my parents didn't have anything more than um, an elementary school education. So they never even went on to college or, you know, even high school. So, um, and for me, it was always like, I always felt as though I didn't belong when I was in undergraduate, doing my undergraduate work, or even in graduate school. And I heard people talking about their parents having all of these like fascinating careers. And, and for me, it was kind of like, oh my goodness, I don't have any of these things to say. I've never, you know, people would talk about traveling to all of these places, you know, the things that their parents taught them. Um, and I actually didn't have, didn't share any of those experiences. And so it always felt, there was a sinking sort of feeling that oh, I, I just don't belong here. Um, so it was one of the things that was always in the back of my head and always sort of like kept me back from really like being vocal about things sometimes because I felt that it wasn't my place. Um, so I would say that was, that's one of the obstacles that has always been there with me. Um, even now when I have a PhD <laughs> um, yeah. and, and I have to kind of like always remind myself when I start thinking about it that, you know, not, not to go down that road. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I think, um, so the, the second thing that I would say is when you, in, in research actually, a lot of things don't go the way you would like it to. So I would say at least like 80% of the, of the time, things don't work. Um, and that's always like a big slap in the face, I would say. Um, because you, you have to be optimistic, right? When you start any kind of experiment. And, but when that experiment doesn't work, especially when it's a big experiment that took a lot that took several months mm -hmm. um you know it it's it, it really sets you down this path of like okay what am I doing like did I choose the right path in life <laughs> <laughs> um so so these are actually two of the of the biggest challenges I have actually faced Definitely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that, that is amazing to hear about, you know, like how you how you came from your childhood all the way to I mean, where you are right now. All right. And finally, so I mean, our um, our target audience is, you know, definitely high schoolers and a lot of people who are currently thinking about entering college and, you know, getting into um, like different careers. So do you have any specific advice uh, for high schoolers in terms of, you know, internships or other things that they can do um, like during their high school years or during their summers? Um, that, I mean, that would help them, you know, make a difference in their community or perhaps um, contribute um, to, you know, I mean, to entering like uh, research and medicine. Yeah, I think one of the biggest things that you can do for yourself is to really expose yourself to the wider world. So if there's anything that can expose you to different cultures, um, to different groups of people, right? You know, so if you're, if you're in a school that has like, um, students who belong more to like, you know, uh, people who are coming from a high socioeconomic background, you know, take the opportunity to actually get involved in outreach programs to go to other marginalized communities and just see how these kids are 
you know, what they have to do, the struggles that they're going through. And sometimes it will amaze you to see, you know, just the strategies that they actually use to, to move themselves and to progress, you know, through all of the obstacles that they face. Because, you know, it doesn't matter how, you know, how much things are always going your way, you're going to be faced with obstacles. And the older you get, the more like, those obstacles are just going to be like (laughs) oh my goodness what's going on here (laughs) um and and it's great to see how how these how these uh kids and their families they deal with these difficult situations that they're in because I think it will really help you um in the future to actually um deal with your own problems that you're faced with And one of the other things I would say as well is don't narrow yourself to a particular field. Even if you're, even if you say that you're interested in biology or chemistry, don't just follow the path of biology or chemistry, you know, get involved in literature, you know, learn about some history, learn about some architecture, something, you know, different things, you know, because you never know like one day, you know, those things would also help you to kind of understand a little bit more about your place in the world. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that, that's really, really good advice for, um, for our high school uh, viewers. All right, so now I'm gonna let Ashita take over um, with the next segment about, uh, you know, women empowerment and your, your experiences uh, as a woman in the workplace. So sure. thank you so much. Okay, okay um, so we will start right away. So you talked about your background and while you were facing your obstacles, did you have any inspirations, especially from like aspiring women who inspired you to continue on? Yeah, I mean, one of the um, most inspiring women, I would say, was the, the, the first person, the first job that I had here um, in research. Uh, so I worked as a research technician in, in a lab at um, Hunter College, uh, which is a city university in New York. And um, this person, her name is Dr. Carmen Melendez Vasquez. And she was the first person who, you know, like looked at me and gave me a chance, you know, um, to actually do some research. And I really admired her because she was someone, she's originally from Venezuela and she worked her way to, you know, going to, to the UK to do her master's degree and then her PhD work. And then, you know, came to the US to do her postdoctoral work and did really, really great research. And during that time, you know, also managed to have a family. So she was managing a family, you know, and two with two beautiful daughters. And at the same time, you know, starting a new lab and mentoring students within that lab, you know, people like me, you know, who was actually doing research for the first time, um, and also other international students coming from China and coming from Eastern Europe, Europe as well. So, and at Hunter College, we have like many minority students and, you know, many of these students were actually coming to her lab for mentorship and, you know, she was just a great mentor to them. Uh, so she was definitely one of these people that I admire greatly. Wow. Um, I personally feel empowered by what you talked, um, the way you talked about her. And moving on to the second question, is there a specific moment in your life or your work where you felt being a woman held you back? Huh. I, I would say I don't think so. Um, I haven't really had that experience of, you know, thinking that as a woman, you know, I, I don't feel um, that I don't have the same opportunities that, that men also have. Um, so I have to say I haven't felt that way in my workplace. And, and I know that I'm fortunate because mm-hmm. of that. Mm-hmm. So for people who do face these challenges as a woman, what advice do you have for them especially high schoolers who are pursuing, let's say, a STEM field, which is generally male dominated? Yeah, so I know some of the fields that are dominated by men would be computer science. So if you're going into any sort of programming kind of environment, it's definitely dominated by men. Um, And 
you know, what I have to say is that you have to be true to yourself. And I think one of the things that we tend to do um, as women in general is if you, if you, if you have a question and you, um, you know, if, if you have a question and then you think to yourself, well, I don't want to ask this question because then people will think that I don't know as much as I should actually know. And I would say don't do that because too many other people do this. You have to ask your question to clarify, you know, what is going on and then get an answer to that question. Because by always silencing yourself, that is not going to help the situation. You have to go out there, ask your questions, because then you will learn more. Because sometimes you never realize you will ask a question and the person that you're asking it to, even though you think that they know everything, they may even say to you, you know what? That's a really good question. I never thought about that. So I would, I would say always ask your questions. I think it's the most important thing that you can do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I definitely agree. And I'll personally take heed to that. And also asking questions. I think I believe that's like the first thing you would do in scientific backgrounds, asking questions before you are able to engage into that field. Yeah. So thank you so much, Ambika, for answering all our questions and for giving this wonderful advice to our target audience, high schoolers. You're very, very welcome. Much. Thank you.